Cornelius du Pueblo and the uh, Colorado Chicano Movement Archives and the Aslan uh, Research Center are housed in the library. So I am so privileged to get to work with all of you and with this um, really interesting and important topic that we're going to be discussing today. I'm so excited to see so many people at our second annual Aslan Center Summer Institute. We started last summer with about 30 people in attendance, and uh, this year we sold out 100 tickets right away. And so we're only going to get uh, bigger and, and bigger. So it's, it's just really exciting to see all of you and to think about all of the engagement and activity that we're going to be involved in today and all the speakers. Um, I'd like to just thank the sponsors for today. So uh, today's event was made uh, possible in part, and I'm going to read this so I get it right, by a Peggy Barber tribute grant from the American Library Association. Also, thanks to Reforma, uh, which is a library association. Thank you for your support. And also um, Title V, Hispanic Serving Institutions Program here at CSU Pueblo and Dr. Derek Lopez, thank you for your support for today. Thank you. With that, I'm going to turn the meeting over to our president of Colorado State University Pueblo, Dr. Timothy Mote. Thank you, Dean Gonzalez. Um, on behalf of our faculty, staff, and students, I, I too would like to welcome you to our campus, to Colorado State University Provo, and to the Oswans uh, Center's Summer Institute. Um, one of the things that I articulate often on our campus is the role of a regional university is to record and transmit the culture of the history and the heritage of the people around us. And in this part of Colorado, the population and the group that you're studying and talking about today is incredibly important to us. So for us to be able to hold a collective, a collective group of people who have a common interest is incredibly important. So I thank you for the community today, um, but I also thank you for the work that's in front of us in terms of the engagement of the dialogue. I'd also like to thank all of the speakers who are with us today, and I believe many of them are probably in front of the room right now. I want to thank them for giving up their time. I thank you for all of your time. I too want to thank Dean Gonzalez um, for really being a champion for this type of work on our campus. Um, I'm also grateful to Tom Summers. Um, this is your second year, third year? Here's your first. It feels like maybe two or three, but it's good to see you. Tom, very good. And then Charlene Garcia Sims. Charlene, is she with us today? Very good. Charlene, thank you. I think both Charlene and Tom are really being the boots on the ground and making events like this happen. Um, in a few seconds, I'm going to introduce you to our, our interim provost. But before I do that, the, the final comment that I just want to make that I think is always important is this notion that you're always welcome on our campus. Uh, we are striving to be the people's university for the state of Colorado and for the Southwest United States, we're thinking bold. But when we talk about a people's university, it's a university for all people and not just some. And it is important for us to really get the word out about what does it mean to, to work and live and to study on our campus um, what are we about, and who actually studies up there on the hill? Um, in this community, we hear a lot about that, and we want it. We want it's important for us, for all of you, to take away the importance of what the work that we're trying to do is to be a university um, for all people. With that said, I'd like to introduce our interim provost, Dr. Chad Kinney. Chad has been on the job. I know this probably during your second, right, your first one. His first month as interim press or interim provost for university. You help me welcome Dr. Chad King. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you for the invitation to, to address you this morning. It's an honor to 
gas to do so. Um, this is great to see the growth from, from year one to year two for the Summer Institute hosted by the Aslan Center. Um, it's great to see so many faces this morning. Having the Aslan Center on the CSU Pueblo campus is a significant step for this university. It re represents a clear connection to people and place, as well as the vision of the university. And further, this is reflected in the theme for the Summers Institute, ultimately to publicly, to publicly share and to preserve the history of people and place from this region and more broadly, the Southwest. Events like this do not just happen. They take hard work and planning. And I do want to thank a few folks that have played key roles in the planning of this event. Uh, President Ote already called out <coughs> Tom Summers and Charlene Garcia Sims. I want to thank you both as well for the hard work that you have done to make this event happen. But I also want to thank a couple other folks who have put in a lot of hard work. Um, Joelle Quickly, I understand that you've been very involved in this event, as well as Julie Stevens. Um, and of course, Dean Gonzalez, thank you so much for making this event happen. The program, the panelists uh, for this summer institute are certainly top notch. You guys have done a great job of bringing the right people together to celebrate this summer. Thank you and enjoy the second annual summer institute hosted by the House of Center. All right, with no further ado, I'd like to call our university archivist and co-director of the Aslan Center, Tom Summer, to the podium. <laughs> Welcome everybody, it's a beautiful crowd today, we really appreciate you all coming here. Um, you, it's been an incredible journey just the last six months of planning this, and we actually sold out like three weeks ago. And so we decided to make sure we have a Zoom webinar as well, so this is being recorded. And uh, folks uh, at home and abroad uh, can, can watch this. And we're really uh, appreciative of everybody who came today. Um, we got a lot of stories to tell, and we hope you enjoy everyone. And to start it off, we are going to have our panel here and introduce all three members. Uh, right off that, uh, Jay Trask. He is uh, the head of archives and social collections um, at the University of Colorado. And we have Megan Frodo, who is uh, the interim uh, director of Rare Distinctive Collections. Uh, she's also the head of archives at the University of Colorado Boulder. And we have, we just met. Just met this morning, Eric Corpio, who is uh, the director of the Fort Mountain Museum and Cultural Center. So I'm very honored to have this panel today. Um, we are going to have three or four questions for our panel. Basically, each member of the panel is going to answer these three or four questions. And they're going to be all very interesting and informative. And I hope you guys enjoy. So right. off and running. First question. And well, we can start all the way from above. Start with Eric and Megan and Jay. So question number one. Because we have archivists and museum professionals here today, all these questions about preservation. So question one is preservation is the activity or process of prolonging the life of documents, artifacts, and other historic items for educational and research purposes. Right. Tell us. Why preservation is important to you and provide us an example of your work. And we'll start with there. Okay, well, good morning, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as I said, my name is Eric Carpio. I'm the director of the Fort Garland Museum and Cultural Center. I'm also the chief community museum officer for History of Colorado. Uh, just a quick story before I answer the question. Um, I actually was telling some folks this morning that uh, my first job at uh, uh, college was actually as an admission counselor here at CSU Pueblo, so it's kind of uh, like coming back home in some ways. Uh, so. I don't know if that's 
if you didn't need to applause for that. But, uh, <laughs> but I do appreciate always coming back, um, uh, especially during chilly season. So uh, glad to be back in Pueblo. Um, I think this is a, a great question. And uh, I'll share a quick story. Um, you know, I have been in the museum field for about five years. So, you know, I don't have an extensive background. Um, I wasn't trained in museums, but I've learned that kind of one of the running jokes in the museum field is if you work in museums, it's likely that you are a hoarder. Right, if you collect a lot of things, it's hard to get rid of stuff. So um, I actually, that's not me. I actually like to get rid of things. Um, I like to live pretty simply, but there are certain things, um, you know, when you move from home to home or uh, you know, when you're cleaning out the garage or the closet, there's certain things that are really special um, that um, even if I want to live a simple life, that I want to hold on to as well. And, um, and I started thinking about when I saw the question, like why is it that there are certain things in my life that when I move or that, um, you know, changes happen that are important to hold on to. And for me, I think it comes down to a couple of things. One is many of the things as I think about those items uh, that are near and dear to me as an individual, often they are things that represent like who I am, uh, my identity, uh, my connection. Uh, they represent uh, where I come from uh, and the people that came before me, many of those items are things like, for example, I've got a Bible uh, that's fully uh, written in Spanish. And unfortunately, I'm not fully bilingual, but um, any time that I moved throughout my life, I've always made sure that this Bible was somewhere where it wouldn't get lost in the middle, or it wouldn't get destroyed. Um, it was a Bible that belonged to my grandmother and it reminds me of uh, you know, my connection to her and her family uh, and our community and our spirituality and all of those kind of things. And so, um, I mentioned that because uh, I think, you know, broadly, when we think about preservation, if we think about those things that are near and dear to us, preservation and the preservation field, uh, I think it's the same, it's kind of the same concept. Like, what are those issues that, that collectively as a community or as a society are important to us that tell us stories of where we belong, uh, where we came from, uh, what our identity is, but also um, items that we want to pass on, right, that we want to to, to represent the stories of who we are uh, to our children and to future people. So um, in many ways, like that's, you know, that's what preservation, you know, means to me. Um, in terms of an example, the first example that I thought of, like I said, I'm with History Colorado and I work in the museum side of History Colorado, but we also have the State Historic Fund, which invests, you know, significant dollars annually in preservation efforts across Colorado. And, Typically, it's in the structures and the built environment, um, not necessarily like artifacts and things like that, even though I think we're changing that, which I think is a good thing. But we had an event about two weeks ago in Hombonito, Colorado. And so I don't know how many of you are familiar with the SPMBTU, uh, which is the first um, and, and oldest mutual aid society for uh, Hispano families in the entire country. Um, and so we gave a check presentation, like I said, about two weeks ago in Antonito for the restoration of that building. And so many people who were part of the organization came and had a chance to give even just two or three minute talk about why that, why preserving that building was important. And I think it related uh, a lot to the story that we talked about, right? A lot of people uh, mentioned that, that that investment in preservation was important because it connected them to their history. Um, it connected them to their community. It told story. It told a story of um, the way the community has persevered over time. And this investment in preservation was a way to continue, you know, that legacy to future generations. And so, uh, you know, that's like I said, that's one of the examples that came to mind. I'm sure we'll get in more as we as we continue the conversation. But okay. yeah. Um, so. As Tom said, um, I'm head of archives and interim co-director of Rare and Distinctive Collections at CU Boulder, University of Colorado Boulder. Um, I've been in the field for 20 years as an archivist. I've worked at three state historical societies and two academic institutions. Um, and it increasingly what I have been focused on is what we don't collect, whose stories are traditionally told in the historical record and whose get left out. And um, all five institutions I've worked at have been predominantly white institutions. So, um, you know, we have a uh, very growing um, Chicano, Latin, Latino, uh, Mexican-American, Hispano 
population at CU Boulder. When I was at the University of Alaska Anchorage, we had a significant Alaska Native population. Um, and traditionally, those stories are not getting told. Um, I know many of you have affiliations with CU Boulder, and you know the reasons why those stories aren't being told at CU. Um, a lot of the stories uh, of um, Chicanos and Ch the Chicanx population um, don't feel safe to be told in a predominantly white institution. So to me, preservation is about finding those holes and creating safe spaces for respectful storytelling. Um, when I came to CU Boulder in 2018, uh, it, I'd already been working, I've been working now uh, with documenting the Chicanx experience in Colorado for about nine years. And I came to CU Boulder in 2018. And um, some of you in the room know what 2018 meant. That was the 50th anniversary of the founding of the UMAS uh, student organization on campus. Um, and uh, some of my archivists were already involved with the community to try to document that story. Um, some of you also know that CU Boulder, our collection of UMAS papers uh, until recently was about this big. So for 50 years of a really the longest running student organization on campus to only have this much material, that's not preservation. That's not documentation. Um, for very good reasons, the collection, the big bulk of the UMAS papers ended up here at CSU Pueblo. Um, and I'm okay with that because that story is being preserved somewhere. Would I like that to happen at CU Boulder? Yes, because of the very deep roots of the Chicano movement at CU Boulder, uh, CU being the epicenter, one of the epicenters of the movement from 1968 to 74, uh, the area where Los Seis died. Um, so to me, it's preservation and being an archivist is not passive work. We have to be actively engaging with the community to create space, safe, respectful spaces for those stories to be told. And if it's not at our institution, to be making connections with other institutions, um, to make sure that there's connections, that I can send research down, researchers down here, that I know what CSU Pueblo has in the Colorado Chicago, Chicano Movement Collection, um, that I can also connect Rhonda and Tom with the materials that we have, because of course there's overlap too. Stories that get told at one institution are not just focused at one institution. They, they're, you know, most, many of the alumni and activists at CU Boulder um, put down roots in Pueblo. Um, looking at some of them right now. And uh, I won, <laughs> talking about you. <laughs> um, and so I wanna make sure that this not just see you Boulder story, this is a story that's much wider. So to me, preservation is not just the physical preservation of the material, it's the, it's the work to engage with the community, um, to build trust with the community so that um, there's some space for storytelling. It doesn't have to be the physical preservation of papers or documents, it can just be, doing outreach so that that the people who live the story feel like they have a safe space to tell that story. And then it gets folded into the historical record and maybe some non-traditional ways through oral histories, through um, CU uh, hosted a symposium last November on um, the deaths of Los Seis um, and uh, issues of race and memory and remembering the six uh, students and activists who died in car bombs in May 1974 in Boulder. Um, so that was a non-traditional way to document that story. And so to me, preservation has to go far beyond just working with the documents. Um, so that's, that's it. Thank you. All right, well, I'm, I'm Jay Trask and I'm, I'm actually from Pueblo. Um, and I was down here at CSU Pueblo for a few years when we started the Chicano Archives down here. And it was an amazing, amazing period of time. Um, and I've been a customer for a while before that, um, over working in the, the ruins of CF and I. Um, so it's really exciting to be back. Um, and I just wanted to say, yeah, um, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I think preservation, um, you know, when we think about it traditionally, uh, talking about archivists, that is, you know, just where we're talking about, where we maintain this material, we make sure that it's accessible uh, for folks for, you know, the next, uh, 100 years, 200 years. Um, but when I'm talking to my students, I always say that, does it really matter if we save this stuff and protect it for 500 years, but no one can ever see it or no one ever knows it's there? So that aspect of the archival work where we have to get out there and be like, this, we have these amazing collections um, that document. 
Um, and we need to make sure that people are aware of what we're doing, of what's out there. Um, and that's such a huge part of the work. And so that building of community is essential. Um, and thinking about different ways um, to connect with the community and different ways to capture those voices. Because um, as Megan was talking about, archives have traditionally been um, voices of the people in power. Um, and that is where history is told. It is just people in power who are saving their own voice um, so that the only history you ever hear um, is their history. Um, and so this movement among archivists um, and the community to fight against that, where we're like, no, we need to actually tell the story, you know, and not just tell that one tiny story. Um, it's, it's such an amazing uh, time to be working with archival collections. And one thing that we're doing um, up at UNC, uh, at Northern Colorado right now, is we're thinking about, um, specifically, we're thinking about our, um, our student voice, um, because that student voice doesn't necessarily get captured within the archives a lot. So we've started working with um, first-generation students where they start to do oral history work together. So first-generation students are, um, it becomes an assignment in one of their one of their first classes is that they need to, they partner up um, and we give them some suggested questions, but we also tell them, this is a, free, you know, this is a conversation. We wanna know what is your experience right now? So that when we have, when we're looking back to look and see what was happening in the community now, we actually have those records already created. Um, and so, and that just on a purely technical preservation issue, which none of us really talked about is also, um, becoming more and more challenging because it's it's all it's a hundred percent electronic so you know people when they think about archivists they always think about us with our white gloves right and worrying about acid free paper but we also have to worry about i don't know acid free bites i don't know like you know <laughs> magical ways to save computer things but it's such a great way for the students and we are trying to create this program you know this this um oral history program with our first generation students where we do these oral history interviews when they first start um and then capture them as they, when they graduate. And then we really want, if we can figure out a way to have like a reunion where then they'll do another oral history interview so that we can see, you know, the lives of these people and how they're shaping the community, how the community can shape them. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's really exciting. <laughs> yeah, so I just want to see if you focus on archives and how incredible dreams to watch us Work with our CCMA advisory board and put together projects like that, oral history um, preservation, <coughs> also the mural projects that we do. Um, preservation is is key. Uh, people think preservation, it's all just about papers, but as Jay and Lawrence have said, I mean, it's also a digital program too. Um, once we get those oral histories, you know, let's say that there's a digital file, and now we're trying to get to a restriction repository. So it's all about access to that point. So everybody can enjoy it and be able to the educational research for the business. And so uh, the panel went up. There's a lot of great things on our website right now that I think you guys will find truly amazing from uh, the CCMA uh, perspective, um, both in oral histories and also um, in the community collection and all photographs that we digitize. Um, we want to make sure it was all ready for this today. But yeah, it was all about working with the community getting those, uh, going out there, finding uh, those collections within the community. But building relationships this is the first, I think the first step before you get into the preservation aspect of it. What's out there? Who's out there? And we were lucky and we were blessed enough to have the CCMA advisory committee to have this series in that direction to meet those people who we need to talk to and collect their, collect their stories and collect their papers and all that. So I agree with everything you're talking about this year, so it's, Preservation is a very important topic to work with these new professionals. Our next question, question number two. The 2022 Summer Institute's theme is focused on preserving Chicano, Latino, and indigenous people's stories. Can you tell us how important preserving these histories has been for you and your institution? And can you give us an example of the I'm sorry, with everything. Right. Um... I think this is probably the reason why many of you are here today. Um, you know, and as I mentioned, I work with History Colorado, uh, and yet, as was mentioned, oftentimes, like historically, uh, the stories uh, 
materials that have been collected, stories have been told, have been through the viewpoint of folks in power. So uh, that's you know that's not untrue of our organization. So you know we have some work to do. I think a lot of our organizations have you know work to do. Um, you know in trying to. Uh, you know, fill out the collection and, and bring in more voices. Um, but you know, and I agree completely with with the other with what the other panelists have said in terms of like working alongside community, uh, building relationships. I think it's important that we, as we do that, uh, that those relationships and that collecting with community uh, uh, continues and perseveres throughout the process, um, and that you know, community is uh, alongside us as we not just collect. Uh, materials, but also interpret materials, share materials, so that the voices are front and center in that in that story. And just to kind of give an example of some of the work that we're doing at Fort Garland, we opened an installation that some of you may have heard about through the media about a year ago on the history of Indigenous enslavement in Southern Colorado. It's a history that uh, you know hasn't been talked about um, often. Uh, you know, when we talk about enslavement in the United States, we often think about African and African American enslavement in the South. Uh, but we don't, many are not aware of uh, the enslavement that took place here in our own backyard in the Southwest. And so we launched this project in 2017 really to begin uh, thinking about and engaging community around how we might be able to uh, publicly begin a conversation and dialogue around this history. And initially, I'll just say, because uh, I, I was in the project since most, almost since the beginning of the project, and early on, um, we had envisioned what you might imagine kind of a, a typical or traditional um, exhibition project where we had imagined that we would work with community, we would work with scholars, tribal partners, um, do our own archival research, and then present um, in an exhibit, in a traditional history exhibit, uh, you know, what we have learned through that process. Um, it became really apparent early on uh, as we were working with tribal partners and with descendants uh, of this history on both sides of the story, that this we needed to take extra care in this process, and so we actually pumped the brakes a little bit, and rather than you know continue the initial timeline that we had for an exhibit opening, we decided to pause that portion. And in 2020, I think late 2019, early 2020, we had decided we were going to host a, a, a community symposium where we were going to invite um, community members, descendants, those impacted by this history tribal partners and maybe a handful of scholars uh, to really engage in more and deeper dialogue um, so that we could you know get the story right if you will um, and um, many of you know what happened in 2020 uh, i think our our gathering was scheduled for may or something like that uh, that ended up being postponed uh, we thought initially we'll do this in the fall when COVID is behind us of course that didn't happen the way that we had imagined at that point in time but we continue to do the work and continue to meet with uh, descendants and uh, even, you know, I'm looking at Virginia Santos, where she has done some of this work uh, with us, connected with us with descendants, connected with others. Um, and I think by spring of last year, we decided, well, uh, rather than continue to postpone this in person gathering, we think we might know enough about how to do things via Zoom now that we've done this for six or eight months uh, to maybe, uh, you know, launch the project again, at least in a public way. And so, initially, and so what we did last spring is we hosted a series of community uh, workshops, what we call community memory sharing sessions. And even that pivoted a little bit. Our initial thought was that we would invite a scholar, maybe a tribal rep to kind of set the stage um, and then you know, um, have kind of a panel discussion. And as we reached out to descendants, inviting them to participate in this dialogue, I felt really blessed because I think every person that we spoke with said, I'm willing to be part of the conversation. But I don't feel that I'm the expert. I'm still learning about this uh, history myself. And so the, just getting that response over and over made us think about even how that those sessions should, should be presented. And so we um, we scrapped the panel <laughs> uh, idea and just so let's just have a conversation. Uh, we opted not to record those conversations because we wanted people uh, to feel comfortable. Uh, we know we knew that this was going to uh, you know be a difficult conversation for many, and it was. Uh, but it was also really inspiring. And so that uh, led us to the installation we opened last spring, which even when you go into the installation, it doesn't look like uh, what I would consider a traditional history exhibition. It was done in collaboration with an artist. The artist actually participated in many of those sessions, uh, but it's it's in our common notes quarters, which is kind of the, the main building at the Fort Garland. 
It's where the commandant at the fort uh, lived. Uh, but it just utilizes um, historic documents, in this case, um, uh, lists of enslaved um, indigenous peoples from Costilla and Conejos County in, Col in southern Colorado. It was, uh, it was done in 1865. So it uses those documents, uh, historic photos of uh, indigenous enslaved people uh, that we're aware of, uh, and it really just presents it in an interesting way. There's no interpretation at all, as I mentioned. The other thing that uh, we did in this installation is that the Commandant's quarters has six rooms in the building. Uh, we're using three of those rooms, and the three empty rooms, uh, that was intentional because to us that was a signal to the community that uh, this is the beginning of a conversation. And so, you know, we, we didn't, my point of all of this is that, you know, we, uh, this project in particular was one that, you know, we, we didn't do all the collecting, gather all the information, and then position ourselves, um, you know, as the experts now that we have, you know, extracted this information and now we're presenting it. But really, it, it was um, an offering to community impacted by this history uh, with an invitation to continue the dialogue moving into the future. And so we imagine this to be a long term project. People always ask how long the installation is going to be up. At this point, we say indefinitely, just because, um, again, it's kind of just the beginning. And I think um, that's the mindset that I think we're trying to bring to many of our projects uh, with communities that um, often are accustomed to having information that is extracted from them and used in ways or interpreted by organizations that, uh, you know, that may not fully represent their voice. And so, uh, you know, we invite you to, to come and check it out. But, you know, again, that kind of what we've learned through that process, I think, has informed, um, you know, future projects that we're working on. So. Um, so I, I think you can, the short answer to the question up there is you probably uh, can guess from my previous answer is hugely important um, uh, to me personally, um, and it needs to be to my institution, to see Boulder. That's been a slow process. Um, I mentioned Los Seis de Boulder before, but how many of you in the room actually know what I'm referring to when I say Los Seis de Boulder? Okay, probably half. Um, so in May 1974, for those of you who are not aware, um, following a year of turmoil on CU Boulder's campus, I'll back up to fall of 1973. In fall of 1973, um, most minority students returned to campus to discover that their financial aid was cut. This disproportionately affected the Mexican American student population at CU Boulder um, because of the work that the UMA student organization had done uh, to bring Mexican American students to campus between 1968 and 1974. Um, from 19, the fall of 1973 through the spring of 1974, there were student protests to try to get the uh, administration to understand uh, the impact this has had uh, to reverse the financial aid decisions. There was a um, takeover of the governor's office. Um, there, that's all culminated in a lot of turmoil within the UMAS Equal Opportunity Program, the program that was bringing, uh, providing financial aid to students, culminating in a student takeover of TB1. Um, there's at least one person in the audience today who was part of that student takeover. Um, during the takeover of the TB1 building, which was an administrative building where, a temporary building uh, where the UMAS offices were held, um, there were two car bombs that exploded on May 27th and May 29th, uh, killing six uh, current students, former students, alumni, um, former staff members, um, and a friend who was visiting from Laredo, Texas. In the first car bomb, Nev Romero, uh, Reyes Martinez, and Uno Chacola were killed. In the second car bomb on May 29th, um, Florencio Granado, Heriberto Teran, and um, uh, uh -oh, uh, Francisco Doherty were killed and Antonio Alcantar was injured. Um, so the six who died have been known since then as Los Seis de Boulder. Um, and for years, uh, CU was unwilling to engage with the story. Um, there was a prevailing feeling on campus among a certain uh, segment of the population that, uh, and I, I say this because this has been told directly to me by uh, people who were on campus at the time, and I and these were not members of the Chicano community. Um, there was a prevailing feeling that they were terrorists or militants, which was the language at the time that was used to describe a lot of Chicano students on campus, many of whom were politically active. Um, but within the community, 
uh, there has also been uh, a suspicion that the car bombs were planted. Um, this was the end of the era of Cointel Pro, the FBI program um, in which FBI agents infiltrated campus organizations and acted against um, campus activists, student activists, killing many. Um, but to until, well, I would say still to this day, there's uh, no consensus about what actually happened. Um, and for many, especially at CU, there was an unwillingness to engage with that story at all, despite um, the resonance this continues to have today among alumni who were there at the time, among students to this very day at CU's campus, um, students of color broadly, not just to come as students. Um, this, I mean, I think we see uh, evidence of violence towards people of color um, and indigenous people still occurring to this present day. And so to have something that happened almost 50 years ago um, resonates so widely, especially uh, in 2020 during George Floyd's murder and um, all of the police brutality against people of color. Um, this is a story that we needed to engage in with in some way. Um, but it, it was a very difficult to get that story, that process started. And um, in 2018, uh, there was a group of students who began to work on designing a memorial to Los Cesta Boulder um, at to a public art project that would be on campus, a physical reminder of the legacy of their deaths to many who are here today, to many um, who are not here today, to scholars, to, as I said, current students, to historians. Um, regardless of how they died and the reasons why they died, um, these six represent the fullness of the Chicano movement, the efforts of students across the country, but especially at CU Boulder, to engage with the movement, to support the United Farm Workers, to march for educational rights, to, um, to work en masse as students, to bring first generation students from migrant farm worker families to campus. I mean, the magnitude of what these 18 to 22 year old students were doing at CU is enormous. Um, and the deaths of Los Seis is a really terrifying and tragic cap to that era. So to not acknowledge that the deaths of Los Seis is to not acknowledge what came before then as well and the work of these students. Um, and it was really difficult for these students to create this public art project. There was a lot of resistance. Um, I'm gonna tell you what happened next, not to, at all to give credit to myself, but I think that having the support of the archives enabled the students to move forward in a way that they might not have been able to otherwise. Um, so we came on, uh, myself and my team, as supporters of this project pretty early on. Um, we got the lead artist into the archives to work with the very few documents that we had, um, but what we had in the collection so that they could understand the history of the Chicano movement on campus so that they could understand the lives of the six who died, not just as victims, but as people who live full active lives as activists and engaged, you know, engaged um, with the politics of the time with the Chicano movement on campus. Um, that work largely influenced the design of the sculpture. It influenced the way that the over 200 community members who became involved in the end. How many of you in the, in the uh, audience were involved in this project? Okay, just Juan. <laughs> um, so as Juan can testify to, eventually we had over 200 community members working to build this public art piece, this sculpture. And, um, even when it was erected on campus, despite the fact that over a hundred people came to the opening ceremony, which was just absolutely beautiful, happened right in front of TV One where the sculpture is placed now, um, involves uh, some uh, indigenous dancing and uh, uh, really powerful speeches by some of the alumni who were there, some of the victims' families. Um, despite that, there was still a resistance to keeping that sculpture on campus. Um, the archive stepped in in 2019 to actually acquire the sculpture. Um, and we did this because we saw that as a way to legitimize the sculpture's place on campus. If we were the owners of the sculpture, um, we, it, could, it could not easily be taken away. If it was owned by the students, um, there were too many excuses that the administration could use for, um, for taking it down. Um, so it's 
when we acquired it with the permission of the artists and the permission of the community, many community members who worked on it, um, it was not so that we could take it. So I use acquire, um, or we, I, I usually use the term, we became custodians of, of the sculpture because acquire actually sounds too, too grabby grabby. Uh, we became the custodians of the story in order to make sure that it has a visual place on campus and, and that we continue to engage in dialogue about this, about this really important topic um, in order to grapple, in order to really understand how CU has, um, has treated its BIPOC students over the years. We need to look at the good as well as the bad. And at universities, I think it's very easy to just focus on the good. We wanna bring students to campus. We wanna provide a great enriching experience. We wanna make it compelling for them to wanna to come and study here. But if we're bringing students of color to our campuses and we are not engaging with the real uh, histories of oppression that many students of color have faced on campus, we're doing a disservice to those students. So if we have a physical place at CU's campus where we can engage with, remember, mourn for, grieve, um, celebrate the legacy of Los Sesta Boulder, which is one of the most tragic events that's occurred at CU Boulder, uh, we can begin to have more balance in how we, um, we engage with the stories of students of color, the histories of students of color, the history of the Chicana movement on campus. So this is a very long-winded answer to say that, um, so engaging with the, the Los Sesta Boulder Sculpture Project was a really non-traditional step for the archives, but we saw that as crucial. Acquiring or becoming custodians of the Los Sesta Boulder Sculpture was also crucial, crucial. It was not, we don't usually do that. We don't, you know, archives take in papers and photographs and, and you know, film. And we don't traditionally take in sculptures that are not physically within our archives. You know, it's out, it's out on a lawn um, in a little garden space about 300 yards from the archives. It's outdoors. How do we do this? Why do we do this? We do this because it's really important to me as an archivist, to my institution, to support engaged dialogue in unique ways um, about the history of our institution and the history of students of color at our institution. Um, so that's been an entry point to doing a lot of more, lot more work with documenting the stories of um, Chicanx and Latinx and indigenous people in general. Um, it actually launched a whole entire project at the chancellor's office level um, in 2020 mm -hmm to um, incorporate more diverse storytelling into the traditional campus narrative. Um, that project's called the CU Boulder History Project and it's ongoing. But the aim is to create spaces within CU's institutional storytelling that allow for more challenging stories like Los Ace to Boulder. So I'm really proud of the university's um, ultimate recognition that um, with the archive support, we need to engage with documenting um, marginalized histories, and uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, but uh, I'm really proud of the work that we're we're doing, and and the the role of the archives and pushing that forward at the at the administrative level at the university. Yeah. So, well, I mean, obviously, I think the answer is essential. And I want to actually jump back and talk a little bit, not about my current institution, but talk about the creation of the Chicano Movement Archives here at CSU Pueblo. Um, how that, that came about. Um, and it really, um, I, there's so much support from Team Gonzalez. It was amazing the amount of support you gave. Um, um, I was, when I first got here, I, I really wanted us to start to preserve marginalized voices, you know, other voices. And I, I wrote a grant without really any kind of clear objective. I have no idea how they funded me where I didn't actually provide them with steps, but they gave me money to start a program like this. And I was sitting at our, reference desk in the library uh, with one of our work study students and I was just talking about like you know we need to preserve you know Chicano voices and she said oh you need to meet my aunt Rita um, she was Rita Martinez's she was uh, uh, Rita Martinez's niece um, and Rita Martinez kind of opened the door um, to the community um, Rita introduced me um, to everybody um, and so and then Freddie Freddie the preacher Hill, um, became the first donor to the Colorado Chicano Archive based on these kind of this relationship building. Um, and we were able to form that initial, um, 
that initial community advisory group. Um, and it was um, it was Freddie and Rita um, and Juan. Oh, Jose, Jose. Yeah, I was I was I was adding Juan to the to the group for some reason. Sorry, Juan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so um, and I learned so much. And like um, the, the support that CSU Pueblo had for this for this program was was really kind of inspirational. Um, um, Rhonda was able, Tinka uh, Carlos was able to um, provide funding so that I could hire um, an assistant, um, a student who, um, he was a master student, he was a member of the community, um, and he and I would travel and visit folks and talk to about our vision of what, you know, we saw this as being, um, and just met a ton of people who later um, would become donors to to the archives. Um, I didn't stick around too long, um, but that was more about my wife getting a job up north, and I had to head up north myself. Um, so I kind of left the the, the, the project. But um, yeah, it was it really was kind of serendipity and the community building, um, which I think happens more in, in archival work than we think. The serendipity of it all um, just happened to be working with Rita's um, Rita's needs. Um, and up at UNC, um, there's not, we're, we're working to build a more um, supportive community on campus. Um, we were really fortunate that um, this year, Colorado, um, you remember the major Chicano exhibit that we had not that long ago um, at History Colorado? Um, History Colorado gave us their, their old panels. Um, and so what we did is um, I worked really close with our um, Chicano Latinx Studies Department um, and Dr. Falcon, Dr. Priscilla Falcon, um, is a member of that department. I'm sure a lot of you know that name. Um, we then wrote panels that were specifically about what was happening in Northern Colorado. So we were able to, the library committed to putting on this exhibit. Um, we were able to put out the exhibit kind of as a first step up at UNC to show that we're interested in, in, in sharing this history and sharing this history. And we're starting to do the research um, to, uh, to tell the story of what was happening up in Northern Colorado. Um, so we did that, uh, oh, about four years ago. Um, and then Dr. Falcon um, encouraged us, well, we've got a whole crop, new crop of students. Let's do it again. So we just redid, um, redid that exhibit in the library and we were able to keep it up for an, for an entire semester. Um, and we had so many community members coming in. There were so many. Um, teachers from the Greeley area. Um, we even had, um, you know, some schools coming up from Denver to come look at this new exhibit that we put up. Um, and we borrowed materials from, from the um, um, CSU Pueblo to, to add to the collection. So we're working at UNC to um, preserve those, those materials. I don't know if we're quite there yet, um, but hopefully um, Greeley is a little bit of a different different community for those who know. So I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> so yeah. Thanks, Jay. Just to add to, to what Jay has said too, just to myself as the new year share this year to build on Jay's foundation and hard work with him on it. Um, and then Ben Allen, who was a famous share of this just before me. Um, it's just that they basically created this foundation for success. And to come to the community and be involved in the home site one and the rest of us is on and you know um talk about Kevin and you know that there's folks in the community because that is about understanding how important it is to protect that history too. Um that's what he's um we've been working on for some last couple months is another organization that institutions may be interested in our own super and real crush. Maybe be groups from outside the state of Colorado. The, uh, the point was made that can they go through the CSU Pueblo first? Can you coordinate with them? So we, so you guys can direct these people to say where is the community that we think would be great to be interviewed. And so we started kind of doing the administrative side, creating agreements with CSU Pueblo, uh, creating uh, agreements with the, the Latino History Project. Um, also working with the Chicago Bay Pueblo uh, Rasa uh, Digital Collective, which is out of uh, Houston, Texas. Um, we found out all the stuff that's going on in Pueblo. You know, we need to record that. So not just anybody's just walking in and everybody's walking in. 
performed peer review for all kinds of different uh, individuals. Um, from the Centuries Award, uh, Steve Wilder, and moved down to Pueblo. Well, do people want to be more protect that history? So they want to make sure that we're talking to the right people. And see if Pueblo is being instrumental and making sure we kind of take the lead on that, coordinate that, and make sure it happens for us to make sure it feels legitimate. People are, are going to the right people in the community and be able to tell the best story on that subject. So I, I appreciate all the work that Jay did in you know, the to make it a big really success today. So we're just building on that success as we go Um question number three. We're doing great on time, by the way. So um, number three, there is a force, so we'll see if we can answer it. Um, question number three. How important is it that communities have access to kind of Latino and indigenous people to serve with their kids? So, uh, I mean, of course, this is critically important. I think for our institutions, it's important uh, for us um, yeah, to have, um, you know, Chicano, Latino, indigenous, you know, archives because it allows us as museums or in other work that we do to tell um, a fuller, richer, more truthful uh, history, um, you know, as we you know, do programming with the public, whether that's through exhibits or you know, public uh, dialogue or conversation. But I think it's just as important, maybe more important for communities as well. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, and talked about our Indigenous Enslavement Project, and it's been really remarkable uh, to see the power uh, that that project and that public sharing of the project, um, the power that that's held uh, within families and individuals as individuals have begun to reckon with that history that, um, that they held. Like I said, this is a, a, you know, a difficult history, but um, one of the things that I didn't mention uh, you know, when I was responding to the last question is that you know, when, once after we opened the exhibit, what, what we hoped would happen um, has actually begun to transpire, where a community has come forward, uh, number one, and, you know, some of the comments we've heard is that, you know, I feel finally, in some ways, like validated uh, because, because this history hasn't been talked about a lot um, by museums or by other organizations, um, but it has been talked about in families around kitchen tables, um, but sometimes not even there as well. Sometimes there were whispers of this history in families. I think the idea that, um, you know, others have shared and the, the organization, the museum has, uh, you know, shared back what we've learned uh, along with community has been, um, we've been told by some it's been healing. Um, you know, we try to do this work with humility. That wasn't necessarily, um, I mean, that seems like a lofty goal, <laughs> uh, you know, but, you know, to hear from individuals themselves who've said, you know, that this has allowed them to begin by, uh, reconciling with this history, uh, understanding and making the connections between the oral histories that uh, have happened, that they've heard in their family, with now, you know, documents and stories and the voices of other people is which I think really validating um, in a lot of ways. And so um, this, you know, this work is, is critically important. Um, I think many of us have mentioned that our own institutions and other institutions across the state and the country, whether museums, universities, um, other archives have a lot of work to do to catch up. But I always think about, um, you know, there's a saying that goes something like, you know, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. Uh, the second best time is today. And so if we can do this work now with authenticity, um, it's hard, you know, we don't want to do it with urgency because I think sometimes that urgency can lead to extractive practices that we want to avoid. But if we can, uh, you know, maybe carry that urgency with authenticity, with humility, uh, with co-authorship, uh, then, uh, you know, I'm inspired even just by listening to the other panelists talk about the ways that, you know, different institutions are, are addressing this. So. Um, I know that uh, we're going to maybe talk about education later, so I'm going to pause right here because uh, other things come to mind, but uh, I'll pass it on to Megan. Yeah, I think the, the key word in this question is access. And what does access look like? Um, I mean, yeah, the, the, the answer to the question is obviously critically important, as, as Eric said. I mean, this is our community history, and I mean our broadest sense. Um, the history of uh, Chicanx, Latinx, and Indigenous people is crucial to understanding um, the development and the history of this region. 
Um, and it, as we've all said before, it's a history that's often been marginalized in the traditional historic records. So it's, it's vitally important that we do this work, but access is key. And what does that look like? Um, one thing I think you're hearing from all of us is a, a revolution in, in the way that museums and archives provide access to materials. Um, at least for me, um, I've had a major transition over the 20 years of my career. When I started, I think I, think I was talking to Tom about this last night, it was understood as archivists, you sit in the back room with your stuff, you know, like you're kind of hoarding it, you're making it accessible, but you don't really want people to look at it, you know? Um, and uh, that should not be how it is. <laughs> I'm embarrassed that I was even, I even had that idea coming out of graduate school in the early 2000s. Um, because as Jay said, if we're not actively creating avenues for engagement with students and scholars, what value does this material actually have? So I think the biggest challenge as archivists that we have today is what does access look like? First of all, it's trying to remove those, the gatekeeping that archivists and museums have traditionally done for collections. So creating policies that allow for anybody to walk into our public institutions and, and access a box of, of papers um, relating to this history. Um, it's trying to digitize material. Now, that's a common question I get is, so when are you gonna digitize everything in your collection? And I'm like, never. <laughs> we at CU, we have 50,000 linear feet of collections. I don't even know how many millions of like paper documents or photographs or films or sound recordings that actually ends up to. But, you know, if you laid all of our boxes end to end, what we like to say is that's nine and a half miles of, of documents, almost 10, 10 miles of documents. So digitization for me is, is careful curation of materials um, that can, can be an, an access point for scholars and students and the general public, genealogists, into um, that can be the starting point. You may have to come, you're always going to have to come to archives and museums to see everything that we have. But can we at least provide some digital access so that you know that the material is there? Um, Rhonda and I were talking last night uh, that uh, many moons ago, Bev Allen, who came on as archivist um, here at CSU Pueblo after Jay left, um, she and I had started this, the very tentacles, early tentacles of a project to create a portal to all um, Chicano movement collections around the state. It did not go <laughs> very far. We didn't have a good uh, framework. We were using a platform provided to us by the Colorado State Library that was basically just kind of a blog platform. It did not work. But we need something like that because what you're hearing from the three of us today is there's overlaps for Chicano studies collections across the state, but scholars and students don't know that. We've got materials at UNC, at History Colorado, at CU Boulder, at the Denver Public Library, at the Carnegie Library in Boulder. I could go on. Um, there's a small collection at Adams State now. You know, there's, there's all this material that could be so rich for scholars to access, to really understand the, the, the stories and histories of Chicano, Latino, and Indigenous peoples in Colorado, um, the, you know, the concept of Aslan, this, this community, this history that we have. But scholars don't necessarily know that it's there. And I'm really gratified to see, especially over the 10 years, that there's starting to be more recognition of that history here in Colorado. So as archivists and museum curators, as librarians, we need to be active in promoting that access and engagement with our, our collections because it is critically important that people understand the history of our land and our people here. So yeah, so we should start to work on that like portal. Again. Yes, we should. <laughs> um, and I wanna talk about a specific um, access to community is like our student access, um, which is, it's, beautiful to watch, right? Whenever um, we'll have a Chicano Studies class who will come into the archives and actually get to use some of this material. Um, and like the, the feeling that the students have when they're actually getting to touch these actual materials, you know, when they actually get to see um, flyers and posters and they get to see letters that were written um, during the time of the, of the movement. Um, it's, it's absolutely, you know, it's inspiring and these students um, come back and come back. I mean, we had one student who I remember quite clearly after the class was finished, um, she then came and asked if there was any way we could hire her 
to work with that collection to do some additional processing to make it easier to find. And we were able to find some money um, to hire to hire her. And she's actually gone on to graduate school now um, to, to study archival sciences so that she can become an archivist um, for the community. She really is thinking about ways to, to, to make access available for everybody. Um, it is, um, it, it's great when these students, you know, do have access to these materials. We, we've also let students um, come in and what they've done is they, they look at the collections and they pick out a specific item. And then we created like mini exhibits where the student, um, they would work in pairs and they would write up why is this object significant, give us a little bit of story about this object. Um, and it was completely curated by the students. So the students just created this entire exhibit on a lower level of our library. Um, and then it's reaching this broader audience, which is more people are seeing, you know, what's important to these students. So it's, um, and students then, these students then are seeing themselves in the archives where they had not before. Um, and it's also, um, in my teaching broadly, when I'm not, you know, when I'm teaching beyond like the um, Chicano studies classes where I'm speaking to them, um, I teach an introduction to historical research class. I make sure that I'm using examples from various communities um, in Colorado so that all of our students on campus are, are aware of you know, the diversity of voices that are out there and the diversity of voices that we have within the archival collections. Um, so for, for us, you know, we'll talk about the Chicano movement, but we also will talk about Deerfield as well. So Deerfield is an African-American community out in the plains uh, in east of, east of Greeley. Um, and so, um, and these students then become cognizant of the multitude of voices that make up who we are. So. Um, to answer that, I know that through the students that have had through the National Humanities Archive this year, we were able to hire uh, three students this past spring semester. And um, our dean, Mike Gonzalez, asked to have uh, an exhibit created for the Wall of Fame event today. And to see uh, the student interns taking an interest to work on a project with me has been incredible. And we're going to start making that too. Um, basically, we gave access to three big collections uh, Luis Martinez, Jose Ortega, and uh, Pretty Freaks. And to see the students get in there and just have at it and find just the nuggets of information about things they had. They had no idea about it. And like the Taurus Boycott, uh, the Rice collection, right? it was just Oh, all kinds of interesting information that people don't really know. Jim Paul does not know. And so at that point, it was like, I stood on the way and said, Go for it, you guys, read that exhibit and see the energy and the passion behind it. Like, regarding this other student who was sitting over there, I was a part of uh, the team in, in their spring semester. It was fun just to watch them, to see the passion behind them and the interest in going by and all that. And saying, You know what, we need to put that up in the too. And it was a lot of fun watching the student interns put that together. And so um, that was in uh, our class exhibit uh, right outside the uh, special collections on the sixth floor of the library. And that's the big uh, trio of students, it was like Rick Garner and, and other students that were student interns in the spring semester. So I agree uh, to see this the student aspect of it. And even the same students are going to turn around and tell that to their families. And that's like the stories of them. That's when they're going to tell their fellow students, tell their professors. And just watching how we hopefully interweaves into the education that's like so getting into a curriculum, uh, getting into the history class, and just making its way and then fulfill their role and mission in the library and also their archives. And they've got some stuff. So that looks to me kind of trying to afford them more information. So let's go. Next question How important is it to you and your institution? That we teach your kind of Latino and Indigenous people, sister in the classroom. And then the follow up question will be how do you suggest we do that? There's quite a bit of all of us in some instances today. So, Eric, how do we do that? Yeah, so this I think is my favorite question. Um, I mentioned that uh, you know I've only been with History Colorado for about five years and that I started my career here at CSU Pueblo. Most of my background is in education, actually. And so I'm, I've talked about our Indigenous Enslavement Project. That's actually um, one of the themes and um, you know core topics that we've been uh, dealing with that's part of a larger project that we're doing called our Borderlands of Southern Colorado. 
project, which some of you may be familiar with, we've got an exhibit at our Pueblo History Museum here in town, at other um, of our Southern Colorado, uh, History of Colorado Museums. But um, it became really apparent to me when I joined the organization that um, as we were going through this uh, Borderlands project, uh, working with scholars, working with community, um, uh, you know, finding this really you know, beautiful, rich history uh, that is foundational to who we are as Southern Coloradans, uh, that it would be a shame that that was limited to only the museum walls, that uh, we needed a way to be able to share this more broadly. And uh, just putting my educator hat on, the first thing that comes to mind is, is this right here, a curriculum. How do we get this in the classroom? And so there's a couple of things that we're doing um, at District of Colorado that I think could be examples. One is we started with um, working with the same scholars that helped us uh, develop some of these exhibit projects across the state to develop um, uh, teacher professional development, to be able to hold workshops, um, you know, some on the weekends. Uh, we were fortunate a couple of years ago to be funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities through their American Landmarks of American History and Culture project to be able to do a place-based teacher education, professional development, where we bring teachers from around the country to the San Luis Valley, uh, tour them around uh, significant historic sites uh, in the region, uh, introduce them to community and scholars, and really begin thinking about how do we take you know, the history that is so rich uh, in Southern Colorado and begin bridging that to the school curriculum. Um, sadly, uh, when we were funded, it was also back in 2020. That threw up a lot of things uh, for us. So we weren't able to do the workshop in person. We did it in 21, 2021 in an online virtual format. But it was just as, um, I think, just as uh, you know, important and significant. And, you know, we have teachers from you know, around the country who, who weren't familiar at all with the history of Southern Colorado that we've heard back from now a year later saying, wow, we had a, I had a uh, teacher from Rhode Island, for example, about two months ago that reached out and said, I just did a lesson uh, on the Mexican-American War, which I added because I learned about through you know, this conversation. So I think that's one way. Uh, we've taken that model and um, one of the teachers or one of the teaching mentors that we worked with that helped us bridge content to curriculum, because that's an important part as well, particularly when we're talking about K-12, is that we can have all the material in the world, but if we don't have someone that can help us bridge that to standards and all of the requirements that teachers have to face, um, you know, then it doesn't do as much good. So one of the educators that we work with to do that is a is a principal at, in, in Centennial School District in San Luis. Uh, her name is Kimba Rael. And Kimba, uh, through that partnership, we wrote a RISE grant uh, about two years ago. Whenever RISE the, the state rise grant came about, um, which was COVID funding for K-12 programs. And what we did was uh, we worked over the last year with Centennial School District to really rewrite from scratch their Colorado fourth grade curriculum. Because if you can imagine growing up in San Luis, which is you know claimed to be the oldest you know settlement uh, or you know, community in Colorado, and go through a fourth grade Colorado history class and not hear at all about the history of San Luis, like what does that do? To a student, and what what message does that send about the student's value and the value of their community and their family and their community's history in contributions to Colorado? So we work with the school district to rewrite uh, the, like I said, fourth grade Colorado curriculum through the eyes of and through the the history and experiences and culture uh, of San Luis and the San Luis Valley, and still meet standards, still be as rigorous. Uh, but really, um, you know, from the school standpoint, the belief is, and I, I you know, believe this as well, is that students can see themselves in the curriculum, um, that creates a stronger self, sense of self, stronger sense of identity, and they can do remarkable things. And so those are just a couple of examples, and again, I'd be happy to, to share more details, and we may be running close to time. So. I'll try to be brief. I'm not good at that. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so it's very important to see you, Boulder. Um, and so I, I mentioned all of the work that the UMA students, the really tremendous work that the UMA students did between 1968 to 1974 to bring Mexican-American students to campus. And um, I've been trying to put numbers to that. Um, CU did not actually keep um, demographic statistics about ethnicity until the late 70s, early 80s. Um, but reportedly, um, we went from, I think, a, uh, I think the words that are used are, we went from a small handful of students, I think there were less than 40 Mexican-American students, to um, several hundred by 1972. 
And um, part of the work that the students did was to ad successfully advocate for a Mexican American studies program, which eventually became a Chicano studies program. Um, that merged with our ethnic studies department in the early 90s um, when the Black Studies Program, Asian Studies Program, and um, Chicano Studies Program all merged together. But CU has this history of student driven desire for um, Chicano and Latino studies. Um, and it's exactly for the reasons that Eric said to see yourself reflect reflected not only in the curriculum, but in sources that inform that curriculum is vitally important to creating. Um, engagement um, uh, with scholarship, engagement with the community. Um, and uh, so we work really heavily um, in the archives with uh, CU's Latino History Project. Um, used to be the Boulder County Latino History Project, and now it is the Latino History Project statewide. It's run through our School of Ed. Um, Hesel Romero is the director of that program, um, who's wonderful. All of you guys should get to know him. Um, and he's really driven, that program's really driven through um, working with uh, archives across Colorado, our archives, History of Colorado, many other archives as well, CSU, um, uh, Pueblo, uh, to uh, bring those sources into, into the K through 12 classroom. So C is not only engaged with um, undergrad and graduate student um, education in Chicano, Latino, and Ind Indigenous studies, but also with that K through 12 aspect. Um, and uh, so I, I think um, I think that's vitally important as for all the reasons that have been talked about before. This is the history of our community, the history of our state. If we're not engaging students with that, we're not accurately reflecting um, that history. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's all I've got to say. So. <laughs> well, and um, I think. Like up at UNC, I mean, we have a really active um, uh, Chicano, Chicana, uh, Latinx studies program, but they're so overworked. There's never enough resources given to these kind of, to, you know, the cultural programs like that. Um, so I think we need to work with, with our institution to get them to rethink about the importance of this and actually supporting these and providing them more faculty, more people who can teach because there's, like I know, like um, like Dr. Aguirre and Dr. Alcatar, they're they're like tasked to be on every single like task force on campus, and they're tasked to do absolutely everything. And so they're just run ragged and they're exhausted, and they're, they've got like this great passion for it. And that's the only thing that I think keeps them going is this great passion. And so it's. If we're moving in a, in, a, in a good direction, I know, and I said disparaging things about creating, so I apologize. Sorry, I feel guilty now about doing that. But uh, I know, like at least at, in our um, in our K through twelve, um, there is a movement towards um, providing some Chicano studies um, in high school. Um, uh, Dr. Jesse Tijarina is working to to get some Chicano studies happening in, in the earlier years. And when we put on that exhibit, um, we for our community advisory group. Um, we actually had representatives from the from the, the local school districts so that they could get their teachers involved so that the teachers, you know, it became part of a, a few teacher training days. You know, teachers came in, um, went to the exhibit, and we talked about the kind of resources that we had that we could support them. Um, but there's so much more that we need to do. Yeah. Um, Can you, can you speak? I'm sorry, I couldn't. Would you be interested in some curriculum for K through 12 uh, for uh, marginalized groups? Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay, who would you talk to? Um, you, yeah, go ahead and send it to me, and then I'll, then I'll work out with our, with our folks, the rest of the folks on campus, and I'll be happy to do that. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, it's, we just need support. You know, it, it, it's essential, but I know everybody, everybody's tired. Well, well, we've got to stick to time. It's at 10 15. I just want to say a big thank you for being here, uh, part of the panel. And thank Jay and Vega and Eric and Brendan. Uh, tell me what's next. Uh, on the Instagram. Well,